So we talked about the fact that uh, vapor pressure is a function of temperature, and the way that we determine how strong a function of temperature it is is by knowing the delta H of vaporization. So let's talk for a little bit about how you would figure out the value of delta H of vaporization. How could you actually quantify it? So this is going to be a fairly long lecture. It's a little bit of a complicated topic, so you have to bear with me on this one. Now, the easiest, maybe, thing to do or the most straightforward thing to do would be to just measure delta H of vaporization, right? The way we would do that is by measuring the vapor pressure of the chemical at a bunch of different temperatures. Plot the data as natural log of vapor pressure versus 1 over T, determine the slope, and that would tell you delta H of vaporization. But it turns out that that's a real pain in the butt. It, it takes a lot of work and time and effort, and so most people are not going to bother with it. So in many cases, what we need to do is estimate the value of delta H of vaporization. So there's a couple of different ways to do that. One is to use something called Trouton's rule, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, probably the easiest way is to use a technique that Goss and Schwarzenbach have, have developed, and I'm going to show that one as well. You'll know Goss, uh, excuse me, you know Schwarzenbach because he's one of the co-authors of your textbook, uh, and he wrote a paper with one of his students or postdocs named Goss, and they showed that, that vapor pressure, the log of the vapor pressure is proportional to delta H of vaporization. So if you just know the vapor pressure, you can back out a pretty good estimation of what delta H of vaporization is. And then there's a couple of other ways to do this, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. Trouton's rule says that at their boiling points, most organic compounds have about the same entropy of vaporization. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because in the liquid phase, molecules are kind of rolling around. They're not stuck in any very specific crystal structure, right? So they're rolling around, and they all liquids then have roughly the same amount of entropy. The only time that that wouldn't be true is if you have chemicals that strongly hydrogen bond to each other, like, say, water, which really well hydrogen bonds to other water molecules. So because of that, water might have like a, almost like a structure of water molecules bonded, hydrogen bonded to other water molecules. But most organic chemicals are not that strong of hydrogen bonders, and so they're just rolling around, you know, like marbles, and they all have kind of the same entropy in the liquid phase. And of course, in the gas phase, as we've said, the gas phase consists of individual molecules exposed to a whole lot of nothing, a whole lot of empty space. So all chemicals have about the same amount of entropy in the gas phase. Um, and so since they have roughly the same entropy in the liquid phase and in the gas phase, the delta S, the change in entropy, is about the same for most chemicals. And it turns out that the value of that is somewhere around 85 to 90 joules per mole degree Kelvin. And of course, the exception, again, is these strongly hydrogen bonding compounds. They would have, you know, they would have quite different delta S of vaporization. Uh, this guy, Kistiakowski, uh, he actually quantified this a little bit more and, and developed this weird expression over here. Um, where you can calculate a, a more rigorous value of delta S of vaporization using something called Kf, uh, which is, you know, a, a, a coefficient here that's, you know, you can just assume that it's equal to 1, uh, and then you're using the natural log of the boiling point here um, so that as the boiling point goes up, this term gets bigger, and so the delta S of delta S of vaporization gets a little bit bigger as a function of boiling point, but it's not a very strong function. Um, and so delta S of vapor vaporization stays pretty constant. And so if you can figure out what delta S of vaporization is, and you know what the boiling point of the chemical is, you know that at the boiling point, delta G is equal to zero. So your only unknown is delta H of vaporization, and you can calculate it by saying delta H of vaporization is equal to the boiling point in Kelvin times the delta S of vaporization. So that's that's a you know easy way to get it. Now notice that this is going to give you delta H of vaporization at the boiling point. Okay, and remember we said that delta H of vaporization changes a lot when you get near the boiling point. So it's an estimation technique. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. It's it's a place to start. It'll give you a reasonable value um, of delta H of vaporization to, just to get you going. So here's a bunch of values of delta S of vaporization to give you an, an idea of what we're looking at here. Um, 
So here's observed delta S of vaporization for a whole bunch of chemicals falling in that range of about 85 to 90 joules per mole Kelvin. And it's not until you get down here to things like phenol and benzyl alcohol, which we know are both very, very good hydrogen bond donators and acceptors. So they're hydrogen bonding to themselves. And those hydrogen bonds are causing these delta S of vaporizations to be quite large. But for most chemicals, the delta S of vaporization is in that range of 85 to 90 joules per mole Kelvin. So that's the actual measured value that we're looking at in the red there. If we used uh, that Trutons rule and we use Kistiakowski, uh, we could do a couple of different ways of estimating delta S of vaporization, and they're pretty close. You know, they come out pretty close to the measured values, so it works okay. Uh, a few other compounds down here. Again, the delta S is pretty constant around that 85 to 90 joules per mole Kelvin until you get to something really strongly hydrogen bonding like ethanol, and it's got a really high delta S of vaporization. Now, we've already said that once you know delta H of vaporization, you can use it to predict the vapor pressure of the chemical at other temperatures. But remember, we said that delta H of vaporization changes a lot when you get close to the boiling point. And the other thing to keep in mind is that if your boiling point is really high, like it's way above the temperature range that you're considering, like in the ambient world, which we've said is around 0 to 40 degrees Celsius, if your boiling point is much, much bigger than that, then you, you have this extrapolation error. You're, you're extrapolating a value of delta H of vaporization from a really high temperature and applying it to a much lower temperature, and that's going to always introduce a lot of uncertainty. So keep that in mind as well. Again, it's a very crude estimation technique to use this, this uh, Trutons rule. Now, Goss and Schwarzenbach, again, Schwarzenbach being one of the authors of your book, they went and just plotted a bunch of data where they have the uh, known vapor pressure of the chemical at 25 degrees Celsius, and they actually had measured delta H of vaporization. This is all just data from the literature where people actually took the time to measure delta H of vaporization, and they plotted them, and lo and behold, the data falls mostly on this pretty straight line. And so you can just do the linear regression here, and you can see that the delta H of vaporization is equal to some coefficient, right? Y equals mx plus b, so here's your slope m, here's your x, the log of the vapor pressure, and here's your b, your intercept of 70 kilojoules per mole. Um, notice that in this equation, p is in pascals, not in atmospheres, not in millimeters of mercury, not in anything else, it's in pascals. And these parentheses here are just telling you this is the delta H of vaporization at 298 degrees Kelvin. This is the vapor pressure at 298 degrees Kelvin. You're not multiplying by 298. This is just telling you that these are the values you would get at 298 degrees Kelvin. So this is just a ridiculously easy equation, right? Because I can go to the back of the book and I can look up delta H, or excuse me, I can look up um, the vapor pressure of the chemical quite easily from the back of the book. Um, and from that, I can then back out a value of delta H of vaporization. It's trivial. So this turns out to be a very, very useful equation and, and is usually your first, um, first, first place you go to, el to estimate delta H of vaporization. Because we just finished saying that if you use Trouton's rule, you're going to be estimating delta H of vaporization near the boiling point of the chemical. Whereas this one is giving you delta H of vaporization right around room temperature, which is probably a lot closer to what you need. So I highly recommend the Gauss and Schwarzenbach equation. It's easy and it gives you a reasonably accurate value of delta H of vaporization. Okay. So that discussion all applies to delta H of vaporization, which is what's useful when you're talking about a liquid vaporizing to the gas phase. But what happens if you have a solid? Well, okay, um, we can use this thing called the Prausnitz equation, which is where we can convert the vapor pressure of the liquid, the hypothetical subcooled liquid, into the vapor pressure of the solid, the actual real solid, at the temperature of interest by knowing delta S of fusion, 
at, again, this is at the melting point, not multiplied by the melting point. Delta S effusion at the melting point divided by R, the gas constant, and then multiplied by the ratio of the melting point to the temperature of interest minus 1. And again, everything here has to be in Kelvin. Don't use other units for your temperature. Um, so this is great, right? Relatively easy. You, you know your delta H of vaporization. You, you can extrapolate all the way down that curve so that you get a vapor pressure of the hypothetical subcooled liquid and then you can convert it into the vapor pressure of the actual real solid. That's awesome. The problem is that figuring out a value of delta S of fusion is not so easy. Unlike delta S of vaporization, it varies a lot. And that makes sense, right? Because when you're in the solid phase, the compound has a crystal structure, and crystal structures are very, very specific. The compound might have to be oriented a specific way. It might be hydrogen bonding with its nearest neighbor. Uh, and so its crystals have a very, very specific structure, and that structure could be quite different from one chemical to the next. And so the delta S, the amount of entropy that you gain by melting the solid, is going to be very different because we said all molecules have, or all chemicals have similar entropy in the liquid phase. But we're also now saying that they have very, very different entropy wherein they're in the solid phase. So the difference between the liquid and the solid is going to be very different from one chemical to another. So there are some ways of estimating delta S effusion, again, at the melting point. This equation uh, uses tau, which is the number of torsional bonds. Torsional meaning bonds that can bend and flex and move. And sigma here is the rotational symmetry of the molecule. Now, I have never found this to be a terrifically useful equation, but I think it's worth at least introducing it to you. Um, and here's an example. So here's examples of what you get when you estimate the delta S effusion using that equation. So here's your predicted value of delta S effusion, and here's your actual measured value of delta S effusion. So first thing you notice is these numbers are all over the map, right? All the way from 225 joules per mole Kelvin down to, what, 35? You know, that's a huge, huge range, almost 200 kilojoules per mole. That's a huge range. Um, so this equation that we just showed could be used because we know the number of torsional bonds here. You know, for example, icosane is a long chain aliphatic compound, so it's got a lot of uh, carbons in a chain that are all bending and flexing, and so it's got 17 for a tau. Uh, and then there's the symmetry value. So benzene has 12 planes of symmetry, so it's got a sigma value of 12. Uh, and you can plug those into that equation and come up with these values over here. And they're not bad, you know, they're close. 225 here versus 207 here, so you're off by almost 20 kilojoules per mole, but that's only about 10%, so it's okay. These are not terrific values, but it's it's a place to start. It's, it's a reasonable way of estimating the delta S effusion. Now, the older edition of your textbook gave a, a simpler equation, which is just delta S effusion is equal to the 56.5 joules per mole Kelvin plus 10.5 times N, which again is the number of flexing chain atoms minus five. If you have less than five flexing chain atoms, then you just ignore this whole term and this goes to zero. Uh, and then you just estimate that everything has a delta S effusion of 56.5. You know, from the previous slide, we know that that's not entirely true. Uh, so, you know, the, the simpler the equation, the more uncertainty it's going to have. But it's, again, it's a place to start. It's, it's something to go on. There are a couple of other ways of estimating the vapor pressures of chemicals. So I'm just going to talk about two papers. These are getting kind of old now, but this is a paper by Larry Burkhart, who's an extremely famous guy, continues to be an extremely famous guy. Um, where he was trying to estimate the vapor pressures of PCBs, you know, again, my favorite chemicals in the whole wide world. Um, he used 11 different predictive methods, and basically he came to the conclusion that, first of all, these non-correlative methods, and those would be the kind of equations I was just showing, they have poor predictive ability. They, they, they just don't do a good job of predicting vapor pressure. 
But correlative methods, which require having a set of compounds for which you know the vapor pressure and then using those as, as um, a benchmark to judge what the vapor pressures are for other chemicals, are not bad. They're much better. And the best method of all is to determine the vapor pressure of your chemical as a function of its retention time on a gas chromatograph, right? So uh, gas chromat chromatography involves, you know, separating a mixture of things into its different components based on its partitioning between the gas phase, which is the mobile phase, and the stationary phase, which is a condensed phase. So basically vapor pressure is the principle for separating things on a gas chromatography uh, column. And so by looking at the relative retention times of different chemicals and judging them against chemicals for which you know what the vapor pressures are, you can calculate the vapor pressure of a chemical, an unknown chemical, pretty accurately. So that's probably the best way to go about it. And you, you might be asking at this point, well, why don't you just measure the vapor pressure? Turns out that's not so simple, right? Just measuring the vapor pressure of a chemical, especially if the vapor pressure is very, very low, you might not have the detection limits to be able to even measure its concentration in the gas phase. So that's why you might want to go to this GC retention time method. Okay, and so here's an example of determining vapor pressures for nonpolar and semipolar organic compounds from GC retention data. This is a paper by Hinckley et al. from 1990. They use two reference compounds, okay? So these two reference compounds are icosane, which you can look up. It's a long chain alkane. And our good buddy, para, para prime DDT, this is the most uh, commonly encountered DDT. There's, there's also a, another isomer of DDT, but this is the one that's dominant. Uh, so icosane has a relatively high vapor pressure, DDT has a relatively low vapor pressure, so they're using these as their two benchmarks. Uh, they know their vapor pressures, they know their, their delta H of vaporization, and so what they did is just use chromatography and measured them against a whole host of unknown compounds, PAHs, organochlorine compounds, etc. They did everything isothermal so they didn't have to worry about changes in temperature. And they determined the relative retention times of all these different unknown chemicals at different temperatures. And by comparing the relative retention times with the vapor pressures of the known compounds, you could figure out what the vapor pressures of the unknowns are. And by doing them at different temperatures, you could figure out what the delta H of vaporization is for each of these compounds. So when you go, for example, to the back of your textbook and you look up a value of uh, vapor pressure, very frequently the value you're going to find is from one of these chromatography methods. And that is considered a quote unquote measured value because it's measured using a gas chromatography column. So this is sort of the gold standard for how you would measure both vapor pressure and the delta H of vaporization for large hydrophobic chemicals for which the vapor pressures are low, so just directly measuring vapor pressure is quite difficult. And that's where we're going to leave off in our discussions of vapor pressure. <laughs>